welcome to Dustin's Kaleidoscope. I am Dustin and I have the pleasure of being here today with Elaine Durbach who is the author, who was a local author, and she is the author of Roundabout. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I learned out, I learned about your book from an interview that we were doing, uh, but before we talk about, and so you're a local author here in South Orange, Maplewood area, but before we talk about your book, I want to get an idea of why you even started writing. Why did you become an author and things like that? So could you start with that? Absolutely. Um, I've been a journalist most of my life. Okay. I, I wrote my first newspaper article when I was five on the subject of television and how it was bad for adolescents. <laughs> I have no idea what a five-year-old thought she knew about any of that. <laughs> but I was very much committed to journalism. I didn't, I didn't ever see myself going into writing fiction. Really? Really? Even at the age of five, you, you just sort oh, of thought? I wanted the facts. I wanted <laughs> to establish the truth, and I thought it was really important to tell people what the facts were. <laughs> uh, so fast forward from uh, being five, mm -hmm. did you have an interest in high school and junior high? Were, like, were you on the school newspaper, that type of thing? Was there a natural progression? You know what it came from? There was a wonderful series of books when I was uh, in junior high Okay. Um, about different careers. Oh. There was Nurse Cherry Ames, and there was Sarah Gay, Model Girl. Look, the names still come back to me. Yeah. And my favorite was Sally Baxter, Girl Reporter. And I thought she had the most exciting life, and I, w I wanted to do what Sally Baxter did. Wow. And I actually dismissed the idea in my later teens, thinking that had been childish, and I must be wrong about it. But I couldn't choose what I wanted to do. I was interested in medicine. I was interested in art. I was interested in international affairs. And it occurred to me that journalism gave you the ability to dip into all of those worlds. And so I became a journalist because I couldn't decide what else to do. So that is pretty interesting that you knew so long ago, like as a child, yeah. and then you continued. Because most people will think, well, I want to do this when I'm five. I want to be, yeah. you know, I want to be a nurse, I want yeah. to be a, a doctor. And then it it's completely changed. So the fact yeah. that you were really, um, strong in your intention about pursuing this is wonderful. Yeah. At what point, like was it college when, or high school when you decided this is really it? Um, I, I was living in South Africa and um, the year I started college, this one very small university, Rhodes University, okay. uh, decided to start a journalism degree. And again it was a degree that allowed for a sampling of so many different things. We did law and economics and language and history. That was what appealed to me, the fact that it had this great variety. And I wasn't sure what I would do, but I loved the variety. I wanted to be able to dip into all kinds of different worlds. Okay. And then right near the end of high school, we had a career day at school. And I went to all the different career stations and I heard about what they did. And then I went to the reporter from the local newspaper and she said, Every day is different. And I went, oh. definitely, now I'm confirmed. That's it. <laughs> that this is for yeah. you. <laughs> Turned out she was a real battle axe. Um, absolutely terrifying to work with. Really? Oh, yeah. But I once went up to her and I said, you know, you helped me make up my mind to get into journalism. And she said, oh, good heavens, dear. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, that was probably not my intention. That was not her intention at all. <laughs> but I was grateful. Okay, yeah. okay, so that was in high school, and then you went off to college and pursued it more diligently as a major. And how, how was that experience, you know, college transitioning into a professional journalist? Well, I, in my, uh, halfway through, I got a scholarship from a newspaper in Cape Town. Okay. And with that scholarship came the offer of a job. Nice. So, um, Actually, when I was finishing college, I was offered a, a scholarship to carry on studying to do uh, literature. And I had a choice between studying or going into the, this newspaper job that had been offered to me. And I'd done a summer uh, internship as a, as a reporter, and I thought, no, I want to be a reporter. And I, yeah, went back to Cape Town and took up this job. And um, I went freelance very early because I loved pursuing the stories that I wanted to pursue and working the hours I wanted to work and I wanted to be able to travel. So from my second year in journalism, I actually worked independently. 
and most of my career I worked as a freelance writer. Now how difficult is that as a as a young reporter doing that? I know a lot of people do it later once they've established themselves in, in the industry, but how difficult was it to start off being a, a reporter in that sense? It was a harebrained way to go. It would have probably <laughs> been a lot better to stay in the established structure oh, really? and be trained more thoroughly in the different aspects. But um, yeah, by luck and circumstance, I managed to keep afloat. Uh, and I, I traveled, I went to South America, I went to the Amazon, I went to Europe and, it, you know, lucky contacts, lucky breaks. I was never a very brave or daring do reporter and I was living in South Africa where it took courage to do some of the reporting um, right. that people were involved in. We were all passionately against apartheid and we w wanted to play our part in fighting it. And I didn't have the guts to do the really dangerous work that brought you into contact with the secret police. Oh, uh, okay. For the most part, I was, uh, I was interviewed. I was. Uh, secret police did come after me at one point. Really? Wanted to know my contacts. Wanted to know who I was seeing and who I was speaking to. And I was flattered. <laughs> I was really honoured that they thought that I might be a threat to the apartheid state. And they were wrong. They uh. were wrong. Now, was it dangerous? Like, even did you feel a sense of danger, even speaking to them, even though not they weren't. I mean, they wanted your contacts, not you. When this man came to my home, um, I was afraid. I knew that he'd gotten my address and my phone number from I didn't know where they were okay. listed. He pretended to be an academic who was just doing research, and I knew that that couldn't be true. So I had somebody come and be in my apartment at the time that he was going to be there. Okay. And um, I had somebody phone while he would be there. And when I saw him, I thought that he wasn't any kind of threat at all. He seemed to be this tall, gangly, kind of goofy guy. It wasn't until many years later, living in New York, when the uh, Truth and Reconciliation uh, oh. Commission was happening. Right. And there was a description of a man they described as Dickensian, uh, apparently harmless looking, tall, goofy guy who was one of the worst torturers in the apartheid regime. And I realized it had been him in his earlier, in his youth. As you a are kidding. Younger, younger man. But nothing that I had ever done really justified their interest in me. Um, okay. I'm ashamed to say. But I did a book, I was commissioned to do a book on the mixed race community of Cape Town when I was 21. Okay. I was way too young, but it was a wonderful opportunity. It was a coffee table book, partly photographs, partly text. Okay. And I got to just take my interviewing skills and go out and talk to people and try and give them a platform to speak mainly to a white audience, the people who needed to hear what they had to say about their lives and what they were dealing with. And that was that was a piece of work that I was I was proud of. It was my first book, in my nonfiction. And was this something that you said it was commissioned, or was it something it that it was commissioned by a, okay. by a publisher? Okay. And when he came to me, I said, I said to him, "Oh my God, that's my dream! Right. I couldn't believe it had come true." It turned into a bit of a nightmare because I was so intimidated by the task. And at one point, I said to the publisher, "I thought I was going to go to the publisher and say to him, I can't." do this book justice. You need to get somebody from the, from the, what in South African terms was called the colored community, mm -hmm. the mixed race community, to write about their circumstances. You can't have a white journalist doing this. Mm -hmm. And I tried to think of who I could recommend to take my place. And everybody I thought of had a specific background or a specific set of prejudices or they had their own experience that they were coming from. There was nobody with this God vision that mm. I wanted for the book. Okay. And I thought, well, if it's, an, if it's going to be a limited vision, it might as well be mine, Yours. and I'll declare that up front. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That sounds like a very interesting book. What is, is it still available now? And what uh, I've seen copies of it on the internet. There are secondhand copies through dealers. It's been in libraries in New York. I'm not sure about out here. They were very few, it was a small edition, but they are around. Okay. And it got me the scholarship that brought me to the U.S. Okay. It opened doors for me. That's a great ways. transition because I wanted to mm. find out how you got to the U.S. And it sounds like that was the way. And once you got here, you're a journalist and you're a freelancer. Do you know anybody here? Do you, how, <laughs> how do you even start? 
Well, I came initially on a scholarship called the World Press Institute Fellowship. Okay. Uh, with 11 other journalists. In fact, we were 10 journalists in the end, based in Minnesota, uh, through the World Press Institute at McAllister College. And we had a couple of months of academic courses briefing us on American politics and history, and then they took us on the road, and we went to 40 out of the 48 states. Oh, wow. Interviewing people all over the country. It was the most marvelous experience. Was there a specific topic? Well, it's designed to equip foreign journalists with a more in-depth knowledge of America. So when they're writing about America, they have a background. Okay. And um, I ended up doing what I think was the ultimate work for them. Um, I married an American. I came back to live <laughs> in the U.S. And I wrote about the U.S. from here for the South African press. Really? So I had this really great background, this amazing privilege of having been all over the country. And writing about America from that position, I was better educated than most of the foreign correspondents who were working out of New York or Washington. Exactly, because you, if you're traveling around, if you're, tra you said 40 or 48 states? 40, 40 states, 40 out of the 48. Right, so yeah. that means you, uh, you're in the Midwest, you're in the Northeast, you're in the, on the East Coast, yeah, the West everywhere. Coast, and yeah. for you to have that knowledge, that must have, I mean. It was quick, it was fleeting, it was an eight month tour, but it was at least a, uh, an, an introduction to the U.S., it was incredible. Okay. And I married a New Yorker, and I started writing for the South African papers from here. Um, our newspaper got closed, thanks to the South African government and economics of newspapers. And at that point, I carried on freelancing in New York. And then when um, I moved to New Jersey in uh, 1997, okay. and was freelancing, and then landed a job with the New Jersey Jewish News which is a group of newspapers in central New Jersey. Okay. And I worked for them from 2000 uh, till 2015, and I still freelance for them occasionally. Wow, so was it hard to find a job to, you were, free, you were working for the South African um, uh, newspaper yeah. from the U.S. Was it hard to find a freelance job once that job was no longer? It was tough, it was tough. Um, and what, uh, the, 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 the job that carried me through the gaps, in fact, were temporary stints at the United Nations writing for the Department of Public Information. Wow. You had a very it, interesting career. It was very exciting. Being, uh, the job itself was fairly bureaucratic. Uh, we were writing a lot of captions. We were writing this kind of very limited briefs about what was happening in the building. But being at headquarters in New York was, ex was exciting. Okay. It was to hang out our windows and watch the limos roll up with the <laughs> world leaders coming in. It was wonderful. Yeah, I loved it. That's yeah. great. We only have a few more seconds now, so what I want to do is, you know, you have your wonderful book here. Mm -hmm. So the second half of the show, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about the book, how you came to write the book, and the biggest thing is that you're going from nonfiction to fiction. So that's quite a transition. So we'll... Oh. I'm we, happy we, to talk about it. Great. <laughs> we'll talk about that when we return. I'm Dustin. This is Dustin's Kaleidoscope, and we will be back in a moment. Bye. <laughs> And welcome to Dustin's Kaleidoscope. I am Dustin and we are here with Elaine Durbach. In the first half of the show she told us a little bit about her background in freelancing and being a journalist and now we're going to talk to you about your newest novel, Roundabout. <laughs> so Roundabout. So for those people who are watching who have not read it yet, Tell us a little bit about it, and then we're going to go back, and I want you to tell me how you transitioned from nonfiction to fiction. Oh, absolutely. Well, the story was inspired by an encounter in South Africa with an old boyfriend. Okay. Uh, people have asked me if it's autobiographical. It absolutely is not. 
other than the fact Just that the that character the has lived in South Africa and lived in the US. Okay. But it was the meeting with his old boyfriend on one of my holidays back, uh, and he was uh, involved with, with somebody, and I'm happily married to my husband, Marshall, and not being, um, not, not being available for any kind of romance or whatever, right. we became better friends than we had been way back. Really? And I found that um, that opening up, that, that perspective so interesting that I got inspired by the idea of writing a story about a couple, about somebody looking back on a long romance to the beginning and what it's like when you first meet in your youth with all the hormones raging and all the tensions that go on with a young romance and how it might evolve over time if you meet um, in your older selves okay. and what could have changed. I would, I might one day write the story about a relationship that ends in friendship, but I couldn't bear to do it with my characters. <laughs> so I have them get back together in their 60s. Oh, okay. 40 years, 40 something years after they first met, they do finally settle down together. And that's not giving away anything because that's established right at the very beginning of the okay. book. And okay. what's established too right at the very beginning of the book is that, the, that he dies. And the story is told by the woman looking back over their lives, which is where the title comes from, Roundabout. Oh. She goes back in, over time to work out what drew them together and what pushed them apart. Okay. And whether he had really loved her. The two of them had just, you know, held on to their pride and defended themselves in so many ways, not wanting to expose too much and not wanting to be too vulnerable. And of course, now that he's gone and she can't say what she wants to say to him, there's this pain and regret. And it traces her evolution over the months after he's died, as her attitudes shift and change, you know, trying to draw on experience and maturity. That's just riveting, because when you think about it, as you were explaining about how neither of them could actually express how they really felt. It was almost like mm. prideful, like I don't want yeah. you to really know who I am or how I feel about you. Exactly. So that's got to be tough. And, and now mm. after the person has died, you, there's nothing you can you, how really do you put it right. Correct. Yeah. How do you put it right? And she needs to come to terms with that. And as much as she's known her own vulnerability, she had not fully understood his. Okay. Both parties in a relationship have hearts that are vulnerable for their own reasons. And people put up masks and they put up barriers to keep themselves safe. Right. And slowly through her own process she has to let down those barriers and acknowledge where he was coming from and where she was coming from. So that's very, I mean there are lots of layers mm. to these kind of characters. First of all, how did you, uh, how were you able to get inside of your characters and express such deep emotions. I mean, because that's, that's not very easy to do, especially in the written form. Look, there are obviously aspects of me in the character. Okay. But um, I was really determined to, although it's told in the first person, so I'm telling it through her thoughts and through her feelings. Um, she's a petite little red-haired ballet dancer. As you can see, <laughs> that's not me. I've got two left feet, I can't dance at all. But there's a very strange process that happens in fiction. When it first happened with me, I was blown away, I was dumbfounded. And then I began noticing, reading what other writers say and hearing other people speak, that this is a phenomenon that really happens in, in fiction writing. The characters take on a life of their own. And now, I was, was this because you were coming from the background of Nonfiction writing? I'd assume that, you know, that you chose between facts and making things up. Right. And in a way, I discovered that making things up taps into a, almost a deeper truth. Obviously, s this material is somewhere inside me. Okay. It's somewhere in my experience, right. it's somewhere in my memory bank. But the characters were doing things that I didn't foresee. They, I knew that they would arrive at a, an end point. I had no idea how they would arrive at that point. And quite often it was, oh, 
oh, that's what you're going to do? <laughs> and, quite, and sometimes it was, no, I don't want you to do that. No, that's not what I intended. But that's what the character's doing. And the character has an inherent reality of their own. Right. That in the end you have to go along with. And of course there are days when they don't tell you what they want to do and they don't show you where they're going and it can be a really heavy push uphill trying to make this vivid and real. But when there's momentum, it's as if they're dictating the story. Now, can you break that down so I understand that? Because I, it's almost <laughs> like the way you're explaining it, it is though some, the characters have taken over your mind and they are writing for you and you are looking in saying, wait, what are you doing? I wouldn't have done that, but why are you doing, like how, explain how, as a writer yeah. how you're able to tap into that. That just sounds amazing to me. It's the most extraordinary feeling. It, and when it's going well, it's the, it's the greatest joy I've ever come across in work. It's magical. And it does tap into the whole of you. You know, you know when you have a dream and the dream taps material that you don't know you knew. Yes. And you don't know where it comes yes. from. Maybe it's movies or books that you've seen, but quite often it's stuff that you can't source. That's kind of what happens when the momentum is rolling. So for instance, in, in this, um, my main character, Sally, meets a man, you know, she's been away from Felix for some years and she meets this American uh, called Charles, whom she marries. And Charles turns out to be a really <laughs> I had so much fun writing Charles. He, um, he has a, a limp from polio and he's a very elegant man, he's a professor, very uh, smart, uh, intelligent. She, even when the marriage is going wrong, she still finds him interesting. But he plays up um, his vulnerability and it draws women to him, it draws his students to him. Um, and he, he uses his vulnerability to, to lord it over people. Really? He's a, he's a faker. And she, it takes her a long time to get over wanting to protect him and wanting to shield him and realize, realizing that he is in fact abusive. Okay. It was so much fun writing Charles. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I had no idea what he was going to be. He's this spoilt, arrogant, um, exploitive human being. And when you're writing him, are you like in the zone? Are you only writing about him? In, relation, in, in just sort of a vacuum, or are you writing him from the perspective of this is how this person will react to him, this is how this other character react, will react to him, or is it just Charles? You know, the, the, the book is quite brief and it's quite simple. It, um, in, a, you know, in, in one of those great big tomes, <laughs> right. there, there might have been multiple perspectives on him. Uh, this is Sally's perspective. It's a, it's a very simple line all the way through. So it's how Sally sees him. Okay. Um, okay. Which I suppose in a way takes less courage than really immersing yourself in an evil character. And he's not evil, mm. but the, char the writers who allow that, who really plunge into the evil characters, I don't know how they go to sleep at night, how you turn <laughs> it down. But we, we're with Sally's view of him. So we go through Sally's learning and we go through her pain, we go through her anger, but it's that one window on him. So okay. in this case, it's a fairly simple, fairly, um, yeah, one-dimensional view in a way. Okay, and, and more of a, a, a question about your writing style. When you're writing about, it sounds like the, you get really, you're really into the characters mm -hmm. and you describe them. How do you write, are you like mm -hmm. in an isolated part of your home? Are you, can, can you be in a busy place like a Starbucks or a library and, and still write just the way you just described, or what's your writing technique? Um, I've found that when I'm, when I'm writing, when I'm really moving ahead with a story, I totally lose touch with where I am. I need to be in a safe, peaceful space. Okay. I felt bad for my husband. He would walk into the study and I would barely look up at him. I didn't <laughs> register what he'd said to me, and he would try and tell me about something and I wouldn't pick up on what he'd said, uh, I would completely forget about time. I'm somebody who likes eating. I like <laughs> eating a lot. 
<laughs> I would go for the entire day without eating because I had completely forgotten. You're kidding. So you're literally writing the whole day. There were, there were times when I... Wow. And, and it was actually a physical issue because I'd get sore. Um, you know, okay. Eyes would get strained. You'd need to be to move and move around and rest eyes and be on the computer. You know, there are physical challenges to it. Right. Um, time would totally disappear. Uh, I had to be very careful that if I had appointments that there was a, an alarm or a reminder because oh. I would lose track of where I was. Wow. It's like moving into the zone. Now, it's not always like that. A lot of the time you're going over things, you're editing, or you're right. pushing, trying to get from point to point in the story. But when the work is flowing, yeah, I found it completely transforming. And this is totally different, I assume, from your, uh, from being journalism. a journalist. Because even though you may be entrenched, like you mentioned that you were, uh, you were in the mixed community in South Africa, in, the, in that particular neighborhood or that community, I take it it wasn't the same, where you were, even though you were talking to different families, it's a different type of entrenchment? You know, being, being in a good place when you're, when you're writing with a story, when you've got the flow of a story, it can be absorbing and work for long stretches, but it's not the same kind of transformation. Okay. I once experienced it, uh, writing one of the chapters on that first book. Uh, people reading the book wouldn't notice any difference in it. It's a book about the schools in Cape Town, the, the schools for mixed race children. Okay. I had been out until quite late that evening and I came back home and I sat down at my desk just to glance at what I'd written at the beginning of the beginning of this new chapter. And I started typing. And I watched my fingers and I thought, I wonder what on earth I'm writing. Wow. And I thought this this presumably is nonsense, but I have no idea what I'm writing. And I wrote for a couple of hours, and I went to bed, and I woke up in the morning and I thought, what on earth did I write? And I sat down and read it, and it was like any other chapter in the book. It was a perfectly coherent chapter. In other words, the information had percolated, had shaped itself, obviously, you know, based on my research, based on interviews. But the mind had worked on a level that was not not the absolutely conscious level. It was working on sub subconscious level. That's amazing that you can even get to that type yeah. of level to do that. It's one of the few times that it happened to me that way in you know writing factually, as but opposed to yeah. fiction. But the fiction, yeah, that getting carried away <laughs> feeling. Wow. But what I find absolutely fascinating, especially with this book. Um, People take possession of the characters in different ways, or they, they correspond with different parts of themselves. So in the same way your child goes out into the world and people see different aspects of your child, yes. and they, they relate to different parts oh. of your child, mm -hmm. they see different, different aspects of your kids. Depending on how they take it in. Yes, they, so. in relation to themselves. Correct. That um, makes sense. Everybody takes their own perspective. Yeah. And Elaine, I could stay here for another 30 <laughs> minutes but we are completely out of time <laughs> i am so happy you came and visited me so that we could talk about your book it has been lovely thank you so much oh my pleasure thank you i'm dustin this was this has been dustin's kaleidoscope and we will see you next time bye <laughs>